actually begins. Let's tap into the flow of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to put this mic down. What if we just for the next 15 minutes would begin to stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, Lord. Have your way, Jesus.
Amen. I'm going to invite those that have continued to come in to join us in prayer tonight. Amen. The scripture keeps coming to mind that it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by his spirit. Amen. So I, I believe that the Lord wants to break up some fallow ground in this house before he, he does what he wants to do. Amen. So I'm going to ask that you would tap into the Holy Ghost for a few moments. There's something that the Lord wants to do in this house, that music, that an emotion can't create and can't stir. I'm going to ask us to lift our hands right now, Jesus. I pray every thought, God, every, every stronghold be brought into the captivity here tonight, Jesus, God. I pray an atmosphere of deliverance, God, would settle in this house, God. I believe for a special flow of the Holy Ghost, God, to run through this house, God, setting the captive free, God. Lord, you come, Lord Jesus, to, re, to to bring sight to the blind, Lord Jesus, God. To again, to bring God, set free the captivity tonight, Lord Jesus, God. I pray, God, tonight, Lord, a releasing of the angelic in this house, God. To minister, God, to the heirs of salvation, Lord. I pray a breaking again of the fallow ground of our hearts, God. Prepare our spirits for the word of the Lord tonight, God. Your word says, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, God. We're hungry for you tonight, God. We're hungry for a move of the Holy Ghost, God. Not an emotion, God. Not a feeling, God. But something, Lord God, that can rise up in this hour, God. An hour full of perversion, God. An hour, God, full of, God, darkness, God. I believe, God, you're raising up something, God, to combat this hour, God. I pray against fear and doubt in this house, God. I pray against every voice of the adversary in this place, God. I pray a clarity of mind, God. I pray a loosing of your word, God. A releasing, God, of a healing flow in this house, God. A delivering touch, God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God, if we can but touch the hem of your garment tonight, God, I'm believing, God, for a special touch of the Holy Ghost, God. Oh, would you open up the windows of heaven, God, and pour out something, God, that we cannot contain, Lord. We humble ourselves before you tonight, God. Be with us only as you can in this house, God. In the name of Jesus, God. Oh, touch minds tonight, God. Touch hearts tonight. I pray revelation of your word, God. I pray a ministry of your spirit, God. Only as you can, Jesus, God. Anoint the musicians tonight, God. Anoint the man of God. Anoint the congregation, God, to receive and hear your word tonight, Jesus. Again, prepare the soil of my spirit, God. Prepare the soil of my heart, God. Oh, God, convict us tonight, God. I pray a prayer of repentance get upon us, God. Oh, prepare us, God. Oh, we want to see your glory, God, as Isaiah saw it, God. Oh, that it would bring us to our knees, God. Oh, and say, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips, God. Oh, God, send me, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh yeah, I feel that wind in this house tonight. I feel the moving and the blowing of the Holy Ghost in this house tonight. And I got a secret. We don't got to wait for the altar call to have a move of God. No. Oh, but I believe that there's a God that can meet you in your time of need right now here at this pre-service prayer. Oh yeah, I feel great expectation in this house. But most of all, I feel that same spirit that meets your faith and that meets that miracle that you have deep down in your heart. I believe right now, everything that you came in here with, all the weight from the week, all that burdensome situation that you've been coming in week to week, month to month, I believe that it can all be blown over tonight. All right now, 
Oh, before we get into the service, uh, why don't we just give up a great praise to our great God. I would to God that some young people would begin to lift up your voice with a loud voice. Begin to pray in a language that you did not learn as a child. We're not going to get into the music until this thing breaks. We're not here to spectate, but we're here to have a move of God. There is a vein of death here. It's here. It just has to be tapped into. We don't have to pray and fast for a level of dominion. But when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you receive that level of dominion. You receive the dominion. Come on, pray with some militancy. Continue to pray, lift up your voice with a loud voice. The spirits of this area, they have gone unchecked long enough. The spirits of Stockton, why don't you let people know, let the spirit world know that there are still young people in Stockton. There is still a lifeline group. Let them know that there is a depth here. Let them know that there is a young group of young people that are willing to go out and take it. They're willing to go out and take it. Hallelujah. I wonder if everybody in the building can put your hands together for the Lord. Come on, why don't you just lift up a little bit of praise before we even begin. Come on, has he been good to you today? Come on, I know it's a Friday. I know you just got off work. But why don't somebody just lift up their voice? Why don't you just clap your hands a little bit longer than what you're used to? You're worthy, oh God. Hallelujah. Let me get your attention just for a moment. I do believe with all of my heart before this weekend is over, there's going to be chains that break. There's going to be addictions that are broken. I believe there's going to be minds that are put back together. I believe that people that are on a path to destruction will be set right. That has already been predetermined in heaven. Amen. But there's something about predestination where it involves a group of people, but it doesn't always involve the individual. What do I mean by that? Where There's something about the conferences and people come to conferences. And when I was growing up, there wasn't a whole lot of conferences. You know, you had Landmark and then maybe one other conference throughout the year. If you went to three conferences in a whole year, my goodness, you were a, you were a conference hopper, you know? Seriously, if you went to three in a whole year, that was a big deal. Well, now every church and every youth group and every district and every section's got a conference now. We, we get about 15 to 20 conferences a quarter, you know, and, and there is something you need to know about a conference. There's not a special spirit of God at a conference. It's the same spirit of God that you experience every Sunday morning. What has made conferences 
special up to this point is that people bring a special expectation when they come to service. But the issue is we go to so many conferences now that we don't bring that expectation anymore. What we do bring is we bring a spectator spirit. I wonder if this one's going to be as good as the last one. I wonder if the music at this one's going to be as good as the one. I'm, I don't care how many conferences you've been to or how many groups or preachers you've heard. All I know is what God wants to do this weekend. We're not trying to outshine anybody. Come on, somebody. We're not trying to just have the best music or have the best preaching. We want and need a move of the Holy Ghost. And it's not going to happen if we just spectate. Honey, if we're just going to spectate and we don't want a move of God, we can shut it down right now. We can send everybody home. We'll give Brother Brown his check and, and he can have a, a free weekend off to do whatever he wants to do. But I believe we want to have a move of God. I'm dead serious. I believe there's people that you came in, you were barely standing when you walked through those doors. Your prayer life was on life support. Come on. Your fasting was non-existent. Your mind has been ridden with doubt and with fear. And I believe the Lord wants to set somebody free. It's going to take a lot more than just spectation. It's going to take a lot more than just watching somebody else go after God. But you're going to have to say, I'm already here. I already spent the gas to get here. I might as well tap in to what's in the atmosphere. Hallelujah. Some, someone bump your neighbor and tell them it's Friday night. Tell them you got nowhere else to be. I mean, seriously, point your finger at him. Tell him you got nowhere else to be. So look at him again and tell him, so you might as well get a blessing from God tonight. You might as well go all in tonight. <laughs> Is there anybody that's uh, want to go deeper than surface level tonight? Well, then you're going to have to do a little bit more than give him surface level. I'm not up here to preach to you. I'm just here to tell you what's already in the atmosphere that's been predetermined in heaven. I can tell you our music team's been praying and fasting. Our leadership teams have been praying and fasting. I know Brother Brown's been praying and fasting. It is already predetermined in heaven that God is going to give breakthroughs to individuals. You need to make it up in your mind if you're going to be counted in that number. I think we need to link up right now. It still feels a little tight. I want us all to link up with somebody. Everybody link up with somebody. Something about when you pray as a body of believers. Something about what you tap in. I, I told Brother Russell, I said, we're not, we're not going to go to the music until we can break some of this up. We're not going to go into the music until we get a good flow going. Because I'm telling you, we didn't do all this to go, just go through the motions, baby. Again, we're not just trying to put on a good show. We need a move of God. Come on, I counsel with a lot of you. You need a move of God. <laughs> Come on, I wish somebody in the pews would come populate this area of the altar. I wish someone in the pews would come down, come to the altar right now. Hallelujah. Come on, why don't somebody just pray till it breaks tonight? He kala bahata. He shonda la bahata. Yeah, yeah, la 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 bo.
I can tell you right now, the atmosphere is charged for somebody to receive a miracle tonight. But scripture teaches me just because there is a charged atmosphere doesn't mean everybody is healed. When Jesus was on the way to heal Jairus' daughter, the Bible says that he was being thronged to and fro by the crowds, being tossed to and fro. But there was a little woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. She crawled on her hands and knees and she was able to touch the hem of his garment. And Jesus looked up and said, who touched me? Jesus was inundated in a in an atmosphere of people who were curious to see what they would do if they would touch him. But he only responded to the one who was hungry. You'll never get a breakthrough through curiosity alone. But God will not deny the hungry. One more time, would you just lift your hands up to heaven? Hallelujah. And as a sign of thanksgiving and expectation, would you just clap your hands one more time to the Lord? Come on, could we clap our hands all over the building? Why don't you a couple of shout? Come on, why don't you add a shout to that hand clap? Hallelujah. Can you lift your hands? Take a few moments, just thank Him. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. You're faithful to all of your promises. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We've come to lift you up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We will not be shaken and we will not be moved Cause even in the trial we put our trust in you And we're standing on your promise that just shall live by faith You can do anything when we take the limits of you You are God are able. Oh, you can do anything when we take the you are God. You are God. You are able. You are able to. Able to do anything. Does someone believe that tonight? Hallelujah! Demonstrate your faith in Him by praising Him. Lifting a hand. Hallelujah! will not be shaken, and we will not be moved. Even in the trial, we put our trust in you, and we're standing, standing on your promise. The just shall live by faith. You can do anything when we take the you are promises of your word hallelujah jesus whatever he's spoken is true hallelujah so we praise you in advance 
Like the victories in hand Knowing you are not a man And you won't lie If you say victory will come By your faith we believe it's done We receive it We receive it So we will praise, so we will praise you in like the, big like the victories and hands Knowing you are not a man And you would lie victory. If you said victory will come By our faith we believe it's done We receive it We receive it So we will praise you in advance so Like the victory Knowing you are not a man, that you are not. If we victory, if we said victory will come. By our faith, we believe it's done. We receive it. We receive it. You can do anything when we take the limits off. Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is the Lord. We're going to sing about that name today. I want you to get beside yourself because you know who that God is. Because He picked you up out of the miry clay and you set your feet on a solid rock. Hallelujah. Above all names, name above all names, blessing, blessing, and honor, and honor. Name above all names, name above all names, dominion, dominion, and power, and power. Name above all names, name above all names, righteous, righteous, holy, and holy. Name above all names, name above all names, glorious, glorious, and worthy, and worthy. He who is there.
Those help right now. God is moving in this midst right now. He's moving in the midst of your situation. He's moving in the midst of your circumstance. He's moving in your family. He's moving in your city right now. This praise and worship that is happening right now is not just in this building alone, but it's moving beyond the four walls of CLC and it is going out into this city. In the name of Jesus, your great God. Your name is above every other name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Just magnify him. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're so worthy of our praise, God. You're so worthy of our adoration, Jesus. You've been too faithful, too good to us.
victory when it comes to your spirit when it comes to your presence when it comes to your voice I'm learning to listen just to rest in your nearness I'm starting to Take me to that place, Lord, to that secret place where I can be with you. You can make me like you. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap Take me to that place, Lord, to that secret place where I can be with you. You can make me like you. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Raise your hands where you're at right now in the Holy Ghost. Let God meet with you today. Ooh, yeah. Today, somebody seek the face of God with the hunger. Come on, somebody seek Him with the thirst in your soul and your spirit. God, we need you. Lord, we need you and we've always need you, God. 
Oh, we need you like the air that we breathe today, Lord God. We need to be in your presence. Don't be afraid to cry out to God tonight. Don't be afraid to cry out for his spirit today. taking some time to be in his presence come on nothing wrong nothing wrong with taking some time to be in the Holy Ghost today oh we love you we love you we love you we love you God we thank you for your spirit God today mm, we thank you God for the move of the Holy Ghost that we feel in this place Take me to that place, 
just sing that together. Can we all just sing it as one voice? Take me to that place, Lord, to that secret place where I can be with you. You can make me like you. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. One more time with all your soul. Can we just sing it together? Take us, Lord God. Take me to that place, Lord. To that secret place where I can be with you. You can make me like you wrap me in your arms wrap me in your arms wrap me in your arms now in your own words just lift your hands and say God we want you Jesus today we desire you Father in this place we want to feel you God we want to know you Jesus today feel you we want to know you God in this place yes Jesus schedule the same spirit that we feel here tonight it's going to continue on to the word of the Lord and we're going to continue throughout this conference in the presence of God God is going to change your life if you let him for whosoever will you may take your seats for a few moments I know you've been standing for a long time just want to give you a little bit of rest today tonight we have a wonderful speaker Amen. And we know we're going to be blessed by his ministry. Pastor Mark Brown is here tonight. Amen. Bless him. Bless him, God. Tomorrow morning, everybody say 10 a.m. Tomorrow morning, we're also going to hear the word of the, we're going to have a morning service and we're going to hear the word of the Lord from Pastor Micah Johnson. Amen. Praise God. Lifeline pastor here at CLC for many years and we're very grateful to have him here with us today and then Saturday night at everyone say 7 p.m. okay it's at 7 p.m. but if you can make it here early all right make it here at least at 6 30 you can come in have some time of prayer really get your heart and your mind set on God amen set your expectation on God we're going to be back here for service at 7 we're going to start at 7 p.m. we're going to have a move of the Holy Ghost anybody believe that amen we want to welcome everybody who is visiting from other churches and from other places. Thank you for coming to this conference. This is for you. On Sunday morning, however, we have a special treat for us that are here at CLC. Amen. Uh, Brother Mark Brown's going to be speaking Sunday morning. Amen. In our morning service as well. Now, we have one little change. Okay. One little change. Now, it's not a change. It's more like an addition. Everybody say 9 a.m. At 9 a.m., we're going to be here in the sanctuary. We have a podcast here with Lifeline. Uh, it's called The Certain Sound. Anybody know what The Certain Sound is? Right? Amen. Now, I'm not here to make a plug. I'm just here to say that we're going to be here recording live with Pastor Mark Brown. Amen. And we're going to be talking about young adults, young adult life. We're going to be talking about young adult ministry. And you are welcome to come and join us in this live session. Uh, we won't have much time. We only have about an hour. But if there is time, we'd love to open it up for questions. But we're going to be here. And you'll be, you are more than welcome to come and join us live. So at 9 a.m., come on in. And we're going to have a good time. Amen. Here uh, today. Amen. There is a scripture that came to my heart when thinking about uh, our schedule. Amen. And thinking about what God is going to do. The word of God says, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. 
For he that hath, to him shall be given. Can we stand to our feet? And he that hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. Be careful the way that you hear. Be careful the way that you hear in this conference. Blessed are the ears that hear. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. But to he that does not have an ear to hear, to he that does not have, the measure that you give it will be measured back to you. If you have just come to this conference to spectate and not to receive anything from God, you just come here to see what's going on. You don't have an ear to hear. It's gonna, deafness is going to be given back to you. Take heed, therefore. But if you have an open heart, come on, if you have an open ear, if you say, God, I want to know you this weekend. I want to, come on, I want to know who you are. God is going to bless your ear with the ability to hear his word. God is going to bless your heart with the ability to receive something from him. So as we've heard this conference schedule, why don't we just lift our hands right now. We say, God, give me eyes to see and give me ears to hear today. Lord, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear in every aspect of this conference. God, bless my heart and bless my mind. Lord, I've come with hunger. Come on, does anybody come with hunger? I've come with hunger today, Lord Jesus. I've come desiring, God, to hear your voice. Change my life, God, in every Everything that happens. He who hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. In the name of Jesus. Can you just pray in the Holy Ghost right now? Just pray in the Spirit as Pastor Morgan comes. Hallelujah. One more time, would you put your hands together if you feel something in the atmosphere tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. I'm grateful all of you are here. Welcome to Lifeline Young Adult Conference 2023. Amen. Very grateful. I believe in the importance of this Young Adult Conference. Going to be talking about it uh, tomorrow morning, but I do believe that the young adults are the army of the end time apostolic church. I believe that with all of my heart. And I'm grateful for the speaker we have tomorrow. He is no stranger to CLC in any way, Pastor Micah Johnson. How many love Brother Johnson and Sister Jasmine Johnson? Amen. We tried to finagle it where Sister Jasmine could sing, but man, it just didn't work out, you know. But maybe we'll get up here and have her do a solo or something. I don't know, you know. But we're grateful for Sister Johnson, uh, all the work. They started the Young Adult Conference uh, many years ago now, and God has given it great increase. I believe it's only going to grow. I believe that we're going to continue to impact those who have not yet found the power that lies in young adult ministry. Many churches, for some reason, when somebody hits 18, they lose their value in the body of Christ and they have this weird, uncomfortable middle season between adolescence and married life. But I believe that we can radicalize and we can mobilize this young adult age. I believe it with all of my heart. And I have great faith that God's going to continue to grow this conference as an influence for the power in young adult ministry. Amen? Amen. Amen. So tonight, very briefly, as the ushers can come, we're going to take an offering. Uh, last year, uh, we had such a powerful move of God with Brother Joe Campatella. We had three nights last year. At two out of the three nights, the Spirit of God was moving so strong, we weren't even able to take an offering and we just forgo the offering. And Pastor Haney always taught me a principle. And he, he reminded me of this principle yesterday. He said, if it's God's conference, he'll pay for it. I don't believe in twisting people's arms. I don't believe in big emotional pleas. If this is God's conference, he will 
pay for it. Last year we were in the, in the red quite a bit because we didn't take offerings for two services. And the very next Wednesday in Lifeline, we received an anonymous donation that covered the remaining balance of the conference and then some. I'm telling you, if you put the move of the Holy Ghost first, amen? And giving has a lot more to do with me than it does God, amen? And so we're going to take an offering. It'd be wonderful if we can cover all the expenses tonight. So tomorrow night, we can just give liberty to the Spirit and go right into the preaching of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you today. We're grateful for what we feel. Lord, now we come to you in, in giving an offering, Lord Jesus. I pray you would stir the heart of the people to give out of free will, Lord. And I pray that those that do give and are able to give, you would return it to them, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, Lord. We're grateful for you, and we believe in the work of God taking place here tonight. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And when somebody shout, amen. 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 On the lower floors, you can march. Uh, the balcony, they will wait on you. In the corners, if you have a credit card uh, out in the middle here, there's three credit card readers. If you want to give a small donation with your credit card, that would help us out greatly. God bless you as you give. As soon as you're done giving, turn around and greet someone. Tell them how good it is to see them in the house of God. everyone to go back to their places but if you can remain standing with us tonight this year I'm so grateful to introduce a man that he really doesn't need an introduction um, I'm sure there's ev everybody in this building is familiar with his ministry and in 2018 if you were here during that time brother Mark Brown preached our lifeline conference in that year and I want to tell you it was one of the most significant, powerful moves of God that I ever remember in my entire life. If you're familiar with CLC, this summer, uh, we had what was called a summer of revival where we invited over seven speakers throughout the entire summer. We had revival all summer. In the infant stages of that planning meeting, Pastor Haney pulled Pastor Chris Villanueva and myself in, and he gave a very short list of men that he wanted there and he gave us liberty to whoever we felt to fill the rest of the summer. And the very first name that he mentioned, he said, I want Mark Brown to come and minister to our church. I know he has a word from God. That was always, 
all the way back in January. His schedule did not fit for the summer, but it seemed to fit perfectly for this week. And so I know that this is in the timing of God. This is in the plan of God. And I know he has a word of God. Would you help me greet the man of God as he comes to minister? God bless Brother Brown. Praise the Lord, everybody. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. God is so awesome. course we used to sing back in the day you know and a few of the lines along the way would say something you know undeserving that's what we are we ought to thank him love and praise him a little more today and a whole lot more tomorrow God is so good he's given us so many blessings amen it is a privilege it is an honor to be with the family of God here in the great state California. West Coast is the best coast. I, I love, love, love coming out to the Wild West. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can reach for those. I give honor to all those that are involved in coordinating this event and allowing my son and I to be here for it. It is a joy, and uh, I'm excited for what God's going to do tonight, tomorrow, and the remainder of this weekend. And uh, I don't know if they have a picture of my family. I always love to introduce my family before going into the Word, just so people don't think I'm some long-lost wayward child. But I do have a wife, three children, and uh, it's a really dark in South Dakota. That's why you can't see us. That's my wife and my three children, Noah, Grace, and Eden. Noah's 13. He's with me tonight. And Grace is 11 years old. And Eden, she is 8 years old. And my wife is none of your business old. And uh, her and I, this December, we will have been married 19 years. And so I love her. I think there's one more picture, maybe, perhaps. Again, our silhouettes. So that's to cover up our acne and our imperfections and wrinkles. But the great state of South Dakota, love, love my family very, very much. I say this every time, everywhere I go. It's not vain repetition, but it is to hold me accountable and it is to let people know the importance of who you marry. And the near audible voice of God I heard in my life was when he spoke to me, said, if it was not for your wife's covering, you would be in hell right now. And uh, some of the darkest moments in our lives, digging out of work, we planted a church 17 years ago and uh, some of the darkest seasons. But I had a wife who is a woman of prayer, a woman of holiness. And I am thankful for her intercession and her prayer covering any and every time before I get up to this pulpit, I reach out to my wife and I have her pray over me. I love her. She is a licensed minister of the gospel. And uh, if you would have prayed and fasted, she'd be here preaching, but you just prayed, so I'm here. And um, so Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 15. I'm just kidding. I know they said people have fasted. And... Uh, so I'll give honor to you all. He gave me a baby water because I guess I have baby hands. So it makes me feel better about myself. Luke 9, 51 through 56. If you're there, say amen. amen. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus sent messengers before his face, and they went. They entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But this village, these Samaritans, did not receive Jesus. 
because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume this city, these people, just like Elijah did? Just want to be like my elders. Jesus turned to them, said, thank you guys for covering my back. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for looking out for me. Thank you for wanting to protect me. Thank you for wanting to wipe out these people. No, the Bible says Jesus rebuked them. And he says, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. I have a simple question for you tonight, and that is this. What spirit are you of? What spirit are you of? Would you pray with me that God's will would be done tonight, that we take heed how we hear and the spirit would give us ears to hear. Jesus, I thank you for the privilege, the honor, the opportunity to be gathered here tonight. Lord, in Stockton, California, Lord, at Lifeline with this group of young adults, I I want to do the right thing, God. I want to do it with the right heart. I want to do it with the right motive. I want to accurately convey the attitude of your spirit. I pray that I would be a vessel of honor. I do not want to be a vessel of dishonor, but I pray that your kingdom will come. I pray that your will would be done and the spirit that would try to quench your spirit would be defeated. I pray any and every spirit that is contrary to the Holy Ghost, Lord, would not be victorious tonight. But Jesus, I ask and I pray that you would have preeminence this evening, God, and let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here tonight on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, open up the windows of heaven, roll back the roof of this church, and fixate a ladder between heaven and earth. I pray that the angels of God would ascend and descend upon this sanctuary, Jesus. I pray that your spirit would have free course. I pray there would be liberty in this atmosphere. I pray in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the name that so clearly identifies the one true living God that every knee is going to bow to, every tongue is going to confess. Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Jesus Christ, you are King of kings. You are Lord of lords. I bless your holy name and I magnify you if you love Jesus would you clap your hands to the Lord hallelujah someone say in Jesus name there is a spirit in this room that is contrary to God's spirit But we are going to obey the Holy Ghost and we're going to believe that God's perfect will be done tonight in Jesus name. I do not know what you thought anticipated this evening's service to be or how to preach would be going forth tonight. But I am going to do my dead level best to obey the Holy Ghost. And I'm not here to hype you up to work up strong emotion in this room. I simply want to convey the attitude of the Spirit tonight. And I feel a little more teaching. I feel a little more, I don't know if you want, I don't want to say talk because that sounds watered down. I am preaching, but it is not with an elevated voice. But do not mistake that as a spirit that is not elevated with concern. There is great concern in my spirit tonight And I want to address what I believe the Lord would have us to be concerned with. And it is simply, what spirit are you of? Another word would be, what is your motive? What is your underlying motive in what you are doing, in what you are pursuing? I really don't know all of y'all personally I don't know if everyone here is ministry minded or not, but I do feel very strong to minister to those that feel a call of God on their lives. Though every single person in this room, what I am preaching 
is applicable to you. But I believe we are in the 11th hour and God has been dispatching the call to ministry at a greater level than ever before because our time is short. We do not have much longer. And God is wanting every hand to the plow. God is wanting all hands on deck. God is wanting all age groups to be part of this harvest. God is wanting both genders to be part of this harvest. God is wanting teenagers. God is wanting young adults. God is wanting those middle-aged and those elderly to be involved. For we are in the 11th hour. And in this 11th hour, we do not have time to play games, to play church. That is why I am not under any pressure whatsoever to perform or to operate in a lane you desire tonight. I am only here. I would love to have been here for the summer of revival, but my pastor has been very intentional in telling me to pray about every place I go and only go when it is God's time and only go when you have a green light. To be honest with you, I... I really would much rather be in South Dakota right now because it is the primary purpose of what God has called me to. I want to reach the land in which I am located in for South Dakota needs revival. But Lord would have me to be here tonight. And so I want to minister what God is trying to speak to you this evening. You need to know your motive in this last hour, this 11th hour, this mission field you are in. If you do not know your motive, it is best that you find out. It would be wise for you to find out the motive behind what you are doing. For there are a lot of things that we can do in the name of being spiritual. But what spiritual realm are you involved in? Ulterior motives, all of us have them. It is the motive operandi. It is the objective of the adversary. He is doing his dead level best that there are motives, emotions that go undetected underneath our heart. There are things that we may not realize have ulterior motives. But if we can get into the presence of God and remain there for an extended period of time, God will help us to identify them and to crucify them so we can be effective and productive in the 11th hour of the church. I believe the subtle is more spiritual than we realize. Our decisions reveal disciplines. The natural reflects the spiritual, and the mundane of our daily lives is very telling. Not everything you and I do appears to be spiritual, but be sure of this, there is something spiritual behind everything that we do. There are principles in our lives, in our daily disciplines. You know, the disciples going out fishing does not seem very spiritual, Jesus talking to them and say, cast your net on the other side does not seem spiritual whatsoever. But because of their obedience in what they were doing, something that seemed so natural produced something supernatural. In the mundane, the voice of God was involved. And the obedience to that voice in their everyday life produced something awesome. It doesn't seem very spiritual if Jesus tells you, hey, I want you to go in such and such town. I want you to talk to a stranger. I want you to get a donkey. I want you to go and do an upper room. None of those things seem spiritual, but some powerful spiritual moments came from the everyday mundane. And we unintentionally have lost our diligence. We have lost our devotion and our discipline. The intentional prevents us from drifting off course. This is the necessity of daily disciplines. Something as simplistic as prayer and fasting. Something as simple as prayer and reading the Bible. This is the necessity of daily disciplines. 
Listen, it, it is just a simple concept that you need to capture in this last hour is that consistency feeds ministry. If you are going to be involved in ministry, you need to be involved in consistency. There are a lot of flash in the pan ministries. There are a lot of people that have radical or loud personalities. They come and they go. This society is filled with loud, vibrant personalities that come and go on their various platforms. But if there is a missing element in the 21st century, it is faithfulness, it is consistency, it is dedication, it is commitment. Whatever spiritual person you aspire to be publicly must first be established privately. I ask you a couple questions. What would you do if you knew you would never be seen? What wouldn't you do if you knew you'd never be seen? For there are some things we would do and there's some things we wouldn't do solely based upon who is watching if we are going to be seen. Jesus addresses some of this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 4, verse 6, and verse 18. He says, look, when, when it comes to offering time, do your alms in secret, not to be seen of men. He's not saying don't be involved in just as we had a moment ago in a public opportunity of involvement in an offering. But some people, their motive behind giving is to be seen. He says, when you pray, do not pray to be seen and heard of men. Jesus is not against public prayer because he's the very same one that says, when you pray with two or three gathered together in my name, so will I be. If two or three can agree about anything, praying, I am there in the midst. There's two types of prayer. There's prayer in multitude. There's prayer in solitude. And both are essential and both play a critical role. But if you only have prayer in multitude, you are missing the most important prayer that you need. And that is prayer in solitude. A daily life of consecration where it's just you and Jesus. Like we sing about finding that secret place under the shadow of his wing, under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where I want to abide. He says, when you fast, do not fast to be seen of men, to be seen of people. It's amazing how we have totally went with a different approach now when it comes to our giving, when it comes to our praying, when it comes to our fasting. These three realms that God said keep secret, keep private, keep sacred, keep personal. We have made public so people would look at us, though all three of those are critical disciplines that God has called us to do because he said, when you pray, when you fast, when you give, not if you pray, not if you fast, not if you give, when you pray, when you fast, when you give. But he's saying there has to be the right spirit behind all of it. Because you can do a spiritual thing called prayer and it be done with the wrong spirit. You can do a spiritual thing called giving and be done with a wrong spirit. You can do a spiritual thing called fasting and it be done with a wrong spirit. I have seen people become more... Look, anytime you come out of a season of fasting and you come out prideful, you have not killed or starved the right spirit. You have fed the wrong spirit. Just because you fasted seven days, 14 days, 21 days, or 40 days, that doesn't make you better than anyone else in this room. That doesn't make you more holy, and that does not make you more powerful. He 
Somehow, some way, we find a way to announce it and let everybody know that we're fasting. That's a whole other subject matter I would love to spend a few hours with you on. But here we are in this digital day, this digital age in which everything is visible. Everything is seen. Everything has been publicized. So I ask you, would you do it or would you not do any of the above if you are never seen, never acknowledged, never awarded? What is your motive for doing them? Most times we start with a pure motive. But we also start with an immature motive. I liken it to marriage. Usually the initial motive of a Pentecostal apostolic that wants to get married, they're living by their life first, better to marry than to burn. That's my motive. I need to get married because I was going to burn. Not everybody can carry the mantle of Stone King. I'm going to burn. So I got married. Was it biblical to get married and not burn? Absolutely. But living at that level is the most immature level of marriage. Eventually, hopefully, you mature in that relationship And it's more than just that. It's about you knowing them and you growing with them and that commitment and that faithfulness. Same thing with alms. It can be, you know, at first when people start giving into the ministry of the church and the kingdom of God through tithes and offerings, they might have got motive because they hear the preacher saying, right now if you give, God will give you a double for your trouble, a triple for your ripple, press down, shaking together, running over, bless God. People start giving because, man, I heard that testimony. They gave and they got a pay raise. They gave and all of a sudden God gave them a car. I mean, that's exciting, but that is the most immature level of giving. I don't give to get. I give because he gave. I want to have the same spirit as Jesus in my giving. Same thing with prayer. And prayer is a good thing, but initially maybe our prayer life begins just asking God for forgiveness. And God, I need this, 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 I need this. And the Bible says we can bring our petitions. It says we can pray about everything. But if that's your only communication with God, that's the lowest level. If that's how I only talked to my wife and said, babe, I'm sorry, babe, I'm sorry, babe, I'm, I'm sorry, babe, babe, I'm sorry, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. I'm so sorry, I won't do it again. Make me a sandwich, make me a sandwich, make me a sandwich, make me a sandwich. Make... Is that a healthy marriage? I'm talking to my wife, we have relationship, but that is a low level relationship. Eventually, I don't want to approach God and always have to talk about forgive me this. I'm sorry this. I'm sorry that. I'm sorry this. I'm sorry that. I did it again. Oops. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I, I shouldn't have done I knew better. I knew better. I know. I'm going to get it right this time. I'm so sorry. Hey, give me a pay raise. Hey, make me a sandwich, God. Hey, give me this. Give me. Somewhere, hopefully, when you talk to him, you can have sessions where you don't ask for anything. You just say, I love you so much. God, you're so awesome. You are so wonderful. You're faithful. You're amazing. Here, I give you my praise. Here, I give you my worship. I want you to know I love you. Same thing with fasting. The first time you probably heard a service about fasting, he was like, power in authority. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the most immature, lowest level motive for fasting. 
I have found myself, I, I, I don't go to fasting because I want more power. I go to fasting because I need God to purify me. I, I, I need this flesh to die. I need him to reveal this inner man inside of me that is oh so wicked, twisted, and perverse. I read some verses for you to consider. I would love for you to write them down if you could. Proverbs 16, 2, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. All of us, we're right in our own eyes. But it's the Lord that weighs the spirits. you got to get off your scale and get onto God's scale. That's where you're going to get the most accurate read of the weight of your spirit. Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. The New Living Translation says it like this, the Lord's light penetrates the human spirit, exposing every hidden motive. I want to feel the presence of God because I love what it feels like, but I also approach it very fearfully because I know if I really am in the presence of God, it is a revealing atmosphere. It is powerful. He's a holy God. It's like you approaching a sun. The intensity of the proximity of that sun, things begin to combust because they cannot be that close to that heat. Just like it is if you really get close to God, there's some things in your life that should combust. If nothing about you has changed in the past year, you have not increased proximity to God. If you are getting closer to God, something along the way has got to combust. Something along the way has got to give. Something along the way has to be lost. Proverbs 21 and 2, every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord ponders the heart. I remember coming across a story, I can't remember if it was a magazine, radio, what it was, but it was about an athlete figure. I'm not here advocating sports or anything like that, but it's just something I heard. And it was about this quarterback named Dak Prescott. And in this moment, in this game that he was in, he was on the sidelines, and, and while he was on the sidelines, he, he was drinking his Gatorade from a paper cup or whatever the juice was, and, and he crumbled it, and he turned, and he went to throw it in a trash can that was a few yards out, and he missed. He's like, well, he get paid millions of dollars. He can't even get a cup in a trash can, but anyways, he missed. No big deal. Goes back to, you know, studying, getting ready to do whatever the next play when the change of possession but then he like kind of looked back over and he saw the cup. And he got up and he walked over to the trash can, picked the cup up and threw it down into the trash bin. And then went back to his seat and continued to study over some plays. All the while, this man had no idea that he was on the jumbotron or whatever. And it was all on display for people to see There's nothing very significant, powerful or spiritual about it, but it's very insightful. That a man who's making millions of dollars as an athlete, sitting on a bench, studying for the big game, just simply goes to throw trash into a trash bin and misses. And something inside of him from childhood, no doubt, of how he was raised, triggered in his heart, I ain't going to litter. Now there's people walking around the sidelines that are, that's their job to pick it up. But just something in him got up to do it. Not because he was seen. Not because for that recognition. Not because, oh, I, I hope one day it gets on the radio. I hope one day someone writes an article about it. But you really, in the moments of privacy, when no one is looking, that is when your inner character is revealed. It's what you do in private. And I, it doesn't have to be spiritual at all, but I believe every little thing we do carries significance. I'm not saying it's going to make an eternal difference, but there is a principle of the little things and a lot of things. And if we can be trusted with little things, if we can be faithful in little things, and we can handle little things correctly, I believe that trickles into the big Bigger things. How do you do it speeding? 
How do you do it? Stop signs. No cop, no stop. <laughs> seen one stop sign, seen them all. Well, I, ain't, I ain't casting stones and standing up here some self-righteous person that's ever come to a complete stop for five seconds at every stop sign. But I think it's the little things that we let our guard down on that we don't think are any big deal, and that's how things can trickle in called Compromise. I'm not saying you all are going to give up the apostles' doctrine because you don't stop at the stop sign. But it's just simple daily disciplines when no one's looking. Say, you know what? I think I'm just going to be intentional about stopping at this stop sign. I think I'm going to be intentional about not going 82 miles over the speed limit. Again, I'm, I'm not casting stones. I'm not saying you're going to hell in a handbasket because you do those things. But I'm just, I believe there's something significant in that. I remember one time I was dating a girl in high school and, and I, we were driving the car. And, you know, I, 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 I don't remember what we were eating, but I just had a bag of trash and I just threw it out the window. And all of a sudden the girl's like, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to do that. The planet, the planet. I'm not, I'm not dating you for the play. I'm dating you because I think you look good. Stop, shut up, you know. <laughs> so anyways, you know, I'm like, I'm like, man, I, I, I do the, it's all going to burn with the fervent heat anyways. <laughs> She's like, yeah, but didn't God create it? And the way you're treating it seems pretty disrespectful to the creator. And I'm like, oh, ouch. This is, this is so stupid. But since that day, as a 16-year-old boy, I haven't littered. Now, I'm not, I'm not asking for a California applause where Gavin Newsom gives me a Nobel Peace Prize or something. I'm not asking. <laughs> But something got in me. I'm not saying you got to take the same path that I've taken. But there are some things that we just, we just are so indifferent, casual, and we don't think that God even cares or God's even watching. But I believe God sees your every day. I remember one time, I, I'm in Bible college at IBC. Sorry, I didn't know about CLC back then. I'm at IBC, and I'm, I'm, I'm working at the airport. And this, this lady walks in, and she had this, you, you could immediately tell this lady had money. She looked first class. Everything just looked, it just reeked of money in class. And so I'm striking up a conversation. I'm working at Starbucks making her drink and I ask what she does. And she was the president of the lottery, CEO of the lottery at that time, I think for the state of Indiana or that region. And uh, we're talking. And so I, I met a lot of interesting people at the airport when I worked there. I, mean, I got to have, uh, sit down and have dinner, lunch with uh, Jeremy Camp. Got to meet uh, uh, the undertaker. That was a great lunch that we had together. You know, this dude's like big. Anyway, I got, I'm getting on... But I, I, would, I would interview these people because I would ask them, basically, look, this is what God's calling me to do. This is what I feel my life, and it's nowhere near to be WWF or E or whatever. I'm not, I'm not going to be, you know, some lottery CEO. But there's principles in your life that I believe that I can learn from to apply into my life. And this lady said, you know what? And so I asked her, I go, you know, how'd you become successful? What are some key tips you give us? And we're just closing up shop. She goes, she says, you know, when I'm away, when I walk away and nobody's watching, what kind of, what kind of store, how clean would this be if, if Howard Schultz was here right now watching you clean this store? How would you treat this store? And when he's, she says, this lady, I'm the lottery, we're not talking about someone spiritual. And all of a sudden just that, that conviction got me. I promise you, Starbucks store never looked better in its life that night. I, we deep cleaned every little nook and cranny and corner, everything. 
because I want to make sure. I'm not saying I'm perfect every day. I make my mistakes and I have compromise and I let my guard down. But there's some things that we need to start putting our guard back up on or we need to start being intentional about saying, you know what? I know nobody's watching me right now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean the church bathroom just like Bishop Haney would be watching me. You know what? I want, I want to pray like Jesus is actually here right now. You know, I think I'm going to get on my computer like my wife is watching me right now. You know, I think I'm... Are you okay? Some people only do things if they're seen or not seen. Some people only give to the homeless when they're seen. They never give to the homeless because they're not seen. You know, it's good to give to the homeless. That's wonderful. And you're like, you're doing some good deed. Here you go. Here, here's a, here's a, oh, yeah, hold, stay right there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, hold that, hold that, hold that $100 bill. Here we go. <laughs> Can we no longer do any good deed without being seen? Or does every deed we do have to be publicized? Is every good thing we do have to be put out there for people to know about? Whatever happened to, you know what, I want to do something because it's right, and it's right in the eyes of God. And that is the only vision I need on me, is that God sees my heart, and I do it as unto the Lord, not as unto anybody else. It's like it always, it always blesses me, you know, when... When someone's out in the congregation, and they're, they're, they're in worship service, and they're just kind of like. But when they're leading worship that Sunday. That's why I, I don't even know the brother's name. I, I didn't even think about it until it was right now. But, you know, I'm sitting there with my son. We're worshiping. And I, I see someone that leads worship, it seems, quite a bit. I, I stalk you guys on Sundays in CLC. And, and uh, he leads worship a bunch of times. I see him at Vince Lee worship. I don't even know his name, but just a, just a meek man, guy, worship to the Lord on the platform. But while the songs were going, he got out from the third, fourth row, wherever he's sitting, and he came right up front and started jumping up. And I go, that's a worship leader. That's someone that's worshiping with the microphone, without the microphone. And some of you, you only display excitement, passion, and zeal when this thing is in your hands. So I ask you, what is your motive? What happened between the pew and the pulpit? Something's got to get a hold of us saying, you know what? I might not be preaching, but I'm going to preach with the preacher. I might not be singing, but I'm going to sing as unto the Lord from where... What's your motive? What's your motive? I, again, I don't know all y'all that were up here today. But I hope some of you that were pushing us to pray before service started, I hope you're that way when you're out there. Oh. Am I getting too honest with you all? I'm not here casting stones because all of us are guilty of it. All of us have the same flesh. Proverbs 27, 21 says, As the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. In the New Living, it says it like this, Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but a person is tested by being praised. There's, there's ways to get tested. There's sometimes when everything's stripped from you, you get tested. You find out what's in your spirit when everything's taken from you. 
Well, another form of test that we don't talk about is so much is when you get affirmed or when you get complimented or when you get a platform or when you get an opportunity to minister. Your spirit is being tested. That's why the best thing you could possibly do is get the spirit test right in private, in prayer. So if you ever have a public test, you have been proven in the secret place. You have been proven in prayer. You have been proven in Bible study and devotions when nobody was watching. The disciples tell Jesus in Luke 17, 5, Lord, increase our faith. We like a verse like, God, give me, I want greater faith, I want greater power. He's like, okay, you want more faith. How about this? When a servant comes off the working field and they come to the master's house, do they sit at the table and expect the master to serve him? He's like, I trow not. He says, that's an unprofitable servant. And he needs to get up and serve others and serve the master because it's his reasonable service. He's an unprofitable servant. And that's Jesus' answer to increase our faith. He says, increase your submission. Increase your service. Increase your faithfulness. Increase your commitment. Increase your obedience. You want to increase the faith to cast out devils and see miracle signs and wonders? Jesus is wondering, are you able to be an unprofitable servant in the 11th hour? Are you willing to get your hand on the plow and not have anyone video you and nobody put you out there on the limelight? Are you willing to get involved in in the harvest and your name never be known. Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? Why are you doing it? Anything you do, why are you doing it? I don't think we slow down enough and just ask that three-letter question, why? Why? It's very probing. It's very provoking. It's very powerful if you ever just stop and ask, why? Why? Why am I befriending so-and-so? I remember, I'm from South Dakota at least past 17 years. And y'all, and most people don't know where South Dakota is. They don't exist. Out in the middle of nowhere, small missions work. And I, um, I got asked to serve as a youth president. There's no one else legal age. <laughs> My wife and I went out there 22 years old, and everyone else is like, you know, two, three times or four times their age. And uh, so I didn't get it because I was like, ooh. This is the only one that wasn't breaking the rule book. So I'm like, all right. So I got asked to serve, and, and I've never in my life handed out a card. I've never promoted myself. I've never done, I've never done any of that. Now, if you all doing that, that's your prerogative. But I remember sitting in a class in the setting, and this, this, this session was going on, and this, this minister was teaching a group your age how to get your ministry out there. Talking about, hey, you go to such and such conference, go to such and have your Bible, have some cards ready, and then, you know, uh, go around and pray for some of those pastors. And after you pray, introduce yourself and give them a card and all this stuff. I remember my stomach was churned. It was, I felt like I was going to vomit. I was, I was, it so disgusted me. And I left that, I left that session so mad. And I called my pastor. I'm like, really? Is that, is that what this is all about? Is that how Pentecost is? Is that how this organization works? My pastor said, yeah, there's some people that do that. But don't you dare ever do that. He says, a man's gift will make room for itself. So I've operated under that instruction from my pastor. But I remember, you know, I got asked to preach somewhere. And, uh, you know, I, at the end, they dropped me off at the, the hotel. And I'm, I'm saying, thank you, you know, I appreciate it. And I go, man, it was such a joy, a delight to be with you. And the person looked at me and goes, well, whenever you're ready to return the favor. I'm like, oh, That's what this is about. You think you scratch my back, I scratch yours. 
I know this may be an awkward setting for Lifeline on a Friday night, and not everyone here feels a call to ministry, but I'm telling you, I'm trying to address some issues in the 11th hour that we don't have time for. You don't have time to learn and figure this out in 30 years. We don't have 30 years is how I feel. I believe that our time is short. We got to get our motives right, and we got to get our hand to the plow, and we got to do this for the right reason. I remember being at this one conference, and, and I'm, I'm sitting, and I mean, I could be very aloof, and some people can misinterpret my, my lack of words when I'm, I don't talk a lot when I'm outside of this. I like, if I sat in a corner all by myself for about two years and not see human life, I'm going to be okay, okay? So that's why some people don't understand that when I'm outside of, but I, I, I don't walk around like I'm a jerk either, you know, I interact, and so I've learned that. In other words, I look like a jerk. So I'm sitting at this table at this conference. They're feeding. And I, I, there's this, this person sitting me by me, him and his wife. And I'm like, you know what? All right, don't look like a jerk. Look nice. Look like, be nice. Be happy. Friendly. Hi. <laughs> so I'm trying to spark up a conversation. Hi, you know. Uh, my name's Mark. And he looks at me. He's like, what's your name? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, I'm from South Dakota. Where are you from? Ugh. Okay. Are you, do you, do, what do you do in ministry? I evangelize. You know, just, like, just like these short things. I'm, now I'm starting to get annoyed a little bit. You know, and like he's looking around, looking around, and I, I'm like, oh, I'm right here if you want to talk. Let's, let's, let's talk. And he's just totally whatever, ignoring me. And I'm just like, I'm a little irritated by it. And uh, so my motive was probably wrong. But all of a sudden, like, the host pastor comes, and he just gives me this big bear hug. Oh, brother, brother, I love you. You're awesome. You know, hugs and kisses, best wishes. <laughs> and all of a sudden, an- another, you know, known one of the speakers there comes and embraces me. Oh, brother, bro. Oh, my God, you're like the bomb.com. Oh. You know, all this embrace, and, and all of a sudden, Brother Stone King comes in, and he's like, oh, boy, you know, and all that, and he embraces me, all this stuff. We have a fan, I mean, so the, literally, I, you can't make it up. It happened like boom, boom, boom. And after that happened, then the, the person sitting across from me were like, what's your name? Oh, Mark, you know, I know it's Mark. You know. <laughs> well, what do you do? I, I just passed her, no big deal. He had no interest in talking to me when I was unrecognizable to him or any others. But all of a sudden, when you know, all of a sudden some known people start embracing and hugging, give me noogies and all that stuff. Now, now the motive is, ah, well, who are you? Oh, well, you pastor. Hey, well, here's my card. I'm an evangelist. He ain't coming out here. My brother was a youth president for years, and he said all of a sudden, he became youth president. All these friends, people wanted to start being friends with him. And then when his term was done, they stopped talking to him. They're nowhere to be found. I I know this is a weird night right now, but I'm telling you, we need to make sure our motives are pure as you pursue ministry. This is not about politics. This is not about weaseling your way in so you can get next to someone and hobnob and rub shoulders so you get your name out there and preach some sort of event. you got to be in this for God. you got to have a pure heart and a pure motive saying, Jesus, I'll do this whether I'm ever known or not. I ask you the question, would you do this, whatever God's calling you to do, if you'd never get a pulpit, never get a platform, never preach a church event, would you do it? Would you do it? Because I know there is a segment in this room that you have the call of God in your life. I'm so excited for you. I'm so, I, I rejoice with you. I believe in your call. I affirm that call. But do not let the voice of people be your only affirmation. Do not seek the affirmation of people. You got to be in a place where you're alone with God. And that's enough to feel his presence, to know that he loves you, to know that he calls you. (laughs) 
He made, uh, I, I don't remember who mentioned him, but someone made this, you know, just a, a statement in jest, saying we can just go through the motions and Brother Brown come here and get a paycheck and leave, and he'll be fine and relax over the week. I didn't even know there was such a thing as getting paid to preach. I remember being, uh, again, when, again, I wasn't getting asked to preach anywhere. And also I got asked to preach somewhere. And I'm at this district event. And I'm like, what in the world am I doing here? But, oh, this is awesome. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And I'm ministering, all that stuff. At the end, they give me an envelope. I'm like, look, man, I'm like, it's kind of weird. My wife gives me envelopes. <laughs> You're a dude. What do you give me an envelope for? <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. I go, and later I open the envelope. Oh, there's a check in there. I'm like, Joey Cucamonga. <laughs> and that check was more than me working three we work weeks at Starbucks. I'm like, so I call him. I was like, hey, hey uh, what, what's going on? He's like, well, that's your, that's your honorarium. I go, Anna, what? What? Hey, Siri, what's honorarium? He goes, man, well, you came, you preached. I go, I didn't expect that. Here's here's just the reality. You very likely will never receive an honorarium for your ministry, statistically speaking. Statistically speaking, you will never be full-time, meaning paid solely for being in the ministry. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry to burst your bubble, but that's just a statistical reality. When we started the church in Watertown, South Dakota, tw- we were 22 years old, two weeks out of Bible college, uh, married a year and a half, didn't have an ever-loving clue what we are doing. God said, go to South Dakota, so we got in our car and we went. Didn't have a job for three months. Slept on the floor. Lived in the basement of where we had church for four years. Worked two jobs for eight years. I'm just crossing the threshold where I have now been more active, solely active in ministry than I have in secular employment. And so this is where you got to just, you got to slow down. This is where Jesus says, look, you see the big picture, you're excited, but you got to count the cost. What are you in this for? And are you willing to take the next step knowing that the probability of you ever preaching NYC is probably next to nothing? The probability of you ever preaching a big conference is not likely at all. But see, what we've happened in this digital age that we live in of everything being advertised, we see someone we know or we admire on those social media screens that they're, they're the big event. And, that's what, and it is ministry. And they're, I'm not saying the person that's on that. Like, I didn't make your guys' flyer. I don't know what pictures you used to me or whatever. But I'm saying, like, we think, okay, that, uh, that, uh, I want to be like that. I, I want to get up there. I want to be preaching that event. Thinking that's what makes me a value. My venue is not my value. My value is drawn from my relationship with Jesus Christ. My value is drawn from places of prayer because after this event's over, I'm going back to reality. I'm going back to South Dakota. I'm going back to where there's more people in this room than there's in the state of South Dakota. But this can become an addiction, and this can become some sort of adrenaline, and all of a sudden this can be the new drug of Pentecost, and your hope is, man, if I can just be the headline singer, if I could be, if I could be the main drummer on NYC stage, that's going to be my affirmation. That's arriving because now I'm the guitar player at General Conference. Now I'm playing the organ at such and such, and now they're asking me to preach landmark. Whatever the case may be, you got to kill that right now. you got to set it in your mind. I am not in it for that. I'm not going to pursue that. And you know what? I'm just going to say, God, I'm okay if I never. I was, I was, I was on a podcast with, with a friend I went to Bible college with and, and we're having this interview and it was after NAYC and he's asking me about the experience of preaching at NAYC and all this stuff. And, and I, I told him my experience and, you know, like I never thought of it. Never, I, I never dreamed of it. I really didn't 
I mean, I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity, but that just wasn't an obsession of mine. And he's always, man, that bugs me. He goes, that's, I, I dreamed of that since I was a teenager. That God, man, I want to preach anyway. See one day, I want to be on that platform. And he goes, that's just the irony. You get to preach it and you didn't care. You didn't even know. That was my first NAYC and the only NAYC I've ever been to. And he's telling me, he's telling me like, you know, uh, you know all that, how it bothered me. He, he shares something so powerful. He says he remembered one NAYC. He walked to the platform and he, he was, he's helping set up and every, all this stuff. And he's just staring at the platform, realizing it finally dawned on him after years being away, decades from being away from Bible colleges. He's helping prepare around that, that stadium. I'm never going to be on that platform. I'm never going to be asked to preach. And like he just, he just was, went blank just thinking on that. And he finally just came to and he says, I'm okay with that, God. And the moment he made that statement to the Lord, just this peace came on him. And all of a sudden he was released to be effective in the ministry that God placed him in. You got to stare at whatever pulpit, whatever platform, whatever instrument, whatever venue, whatever it is that you're dreaming of. You just got to make up your mind. You know what? I am at peace with being hidden. I am at peace with serving the Lord as an unprofitable servant in the kingdom of God. Can we lift our hands for just a moment? I'm, I'm going to try to hurry up here. I know I'm rambling quite a bit. I'm going all over the place. But I'm, I'm just trying to hit a few things in the spirit, and we're going to respond in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I, I need your help right now, Lord. I, I pray, God, that you would take, take scales off of eyes. I pray you open up ears to hear. Let them take heed how they hear. This is the last generation. I believe, God, the final generation upon whom the ends of the world have come. I, I want to live that way. I believe that way. And in the name of Jesus, I pray we get it right. We don't have three decades to figure this out. They don't have, Lord, much longer to figure this out. I pray they settle it therefore in their hearts tonight, God, that we have a right heart, that we have a right motive. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I work Worship you, Jesus. Come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Ah. Ah. I know none of you would ever come out and say this. None of us would. I'm in it for the money. I'm in it for the fame. I'm in it to be popular. I, nobody would ever say that in ministry. But that's, that's the objective of pride. It wants you to be the last one to find out. And by the time you found out, you're destroyed. Friend of mine, I don't know if this statement's original. I'll just give him credit and say it's original so he feels good. But he's my best friend. I love, I love Chris Green, and he, he told me this one. He goes, the bigger the vehicle, the bigger the blind spot. You know, Mini Cooper, you could, you know, see everything. You drive a semi, it's a bigger blind spot. So as you grow in your ministry, you have a bigger blind spot. And that's why you need people in your life to help you see things you cannot see. I need people to rebuke me. I need people to call things out in my life. I need it. I have a pastor. I have friends. They talk about Joey Campitella. Him and I were, were near dear friends, but he, he, he's iron that sharps iron. 
You need that. You need people to help you see what you cannot see. Because the devil wants to destroy you, you and your ministry in this final hour that we are living in right now. None of us would say, I'm in this for the money. I'm in this for that. And I made that statement that may bother you or shock you that you may never, ever be full-time ministry. But will you still pursue it? That's when you know your motive's right. You, you may never get paid to sing. You may never get paid to preach. But here's the truth of the matter. You get paid better than you deserve. For it says in Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. That's what you deserve as your paycheck is death. But Jesus forgave us of our sins. And then on top of that, for him to invite you into ministry? Whew. We are at a dangerous place. I'm very thankful for the blessings that we have in Pentecost right now. But there's a lot of dangers. Because at first, I remember, I was just like blown away that I, I received a, a paycheck. And now, you know, I've been doing it for a few years, so I, I kind of know. And it sounds like, oh, Brother Brown, here's, here's the honorary. I'm, oh, thank you. Know the routine. I remember one time going back to the hotel, and I opened, I opened the check, the envelope, and I looked at it, and I was like, what? It wasn't as much as it's been in the past. I was just, just kind of like a little bothered by it. All of a sudden, the Lord's like, what, that's not enough for you? Well, how much do you think you deserve, Mark? I have a strong fear that we're losing the purity in ministry. And we have an opportunity with the next generation coming to course correct so that you're in this with the right purpose and motive. You can do this grudgingly. You can do this of necessity. But there's another method that God prefers. God loves a cheerful giver. When we become willful, cheerful, and sacrificial, you will have the attention and the favor of God on your life. If you begin to say, you know what, God? Here's my hands. Here's my feet. And God, I'll do anything you ask of me. There's nothing beneath me. There's nothing, God, that I won't say no to. God, there's no church too small. There's nothing too far out there for me. God, I am just thankful to be saved. And God, here are my hands. Here are my feet. Lord, I am a willing vessel. I yield myself to you. I surrender. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that I have the right spirit in ministry, that I have the right spirit in serving you. In the name of Jesus. Perhaps we haven't seen another ministry like the Apostle Paul because there's not another person living like the Apostle Paul. Say, you know what? When the church provides, awesome. But when it can't, I'll go to work. I'll work my own job. I'll... Ah. 
I wonder if there's a sacrificing spirit in this room saying, look, I might be unknown here, but as long as I'm well known there, I want God to know me in the prayer room. I want God to know me in the back of the alley where I'm reaching to somebody and nobody else has to know about it. God, I want to be a generation that is living you for you with purity, with a right heart, and a right motive. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your voice. Ah, Say, oh, lo, 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 ro, 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 ba, la, le, la, la. Hey, oh, lo, lo, ro, 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 do not take the bait of the enemy. Do not fall into the trap of getting picky about placement. Again, this is a statistical reality, CLC. As most of you graduates, there will be nobody knocking at your door for you to come to that church and you get paid. And if you sit and you wait till payday comes, you're just going to be another pew warmer in Pentecost. And it's always funny to me how the will of God seems to line up with everything our flesh wants. Oh, big church, big pay, big platform must be the will of God. I haven't always got it right. But I am thankful. I am thankful that I said yes to God and went to South Dakota. It was a hard, hard path. It still is hard. All this other stuff I get to do, I'm thankful for it. But I'm, I'm in love with South Dakota. I never get asked to preach anywhere else in my life. I've been paid better than I deserve, but I'm in love with my purpose. My purpose is South Dakota. You got to find your purpose, and you got to get a pure motive in pursuing it. You got to be okay with it. There's, there's some powerful people that I've met that nobody even knows exists. Powerful people. Amazing. But all we're busy doing is setting ourselves up for failure, staring at social media and thinking that's where we're going to get our value is when we're what's trending. There's powerful people in this room that aren't trending in Pentecost. But the devil knows who they are. Jesus knows who they are. And that's all that matters. What spirit are you of? Is there anyone here that just wants to kind of step on God's scale? I know it's a scary thing to do it. But what would happen if you just step out from where you're at and just step on the scale and be honest with Jesus for a little bit? I always hear of dreams and visions that people have of preaching to large crowds. But I never hear people have dreams and visions of teaching a Bible study to one soul. Why is that? Is it possible because there's a little flesh involved that we think preaching to big crowds and stadiums is more dynamic and powerful than a home Bible study in one soul? Where's somebody that's going to get a burden to do something for the Lord? Come on, just step on that scale. Let God be 
Let God's light shine on your heart right now. Let the light of the Lord shine on your heart and expose every hidden motive. There's not a single person in this room that's exempt from it. We are all flesh. We all have ulterior motives. We all would like that opportunity to be known and seen. But we got to be determined, God, I don't want the wrong motive to be the wind in my sail. I don't want the wrong motive, God, to be what's coursing through my veins. I don't want that to be the driving force. Let there be a return to purity in ministry. Let there be a return to purity in ministry. I pray this generation could get it right. I pray you would realign us, God. I pray you course correct us right now in the Holy Ghost. That's it. Come on. That's it. Search your heart and your motives in the presence of God right now. Oh, Lord, search my heart and know me. Try my spirit and see if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, lead me in the way of everlasting. I don't want wickedness in my heart. My heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? So I pray, Lord, that you would try the reins of my heart. I pray, God, right now that you would reveal any and every hidden thing inside of me. I want to do this for the right reason as unto the Lord, not to us but to you be the glory not to us but to you be the honor in the name of Jesus we've got to decrease you've got to increase Lord I will be willing Lord to reduce my following so they will follow you I don't want to be what's trending I don't want to be what is seen I want you to be known I want you to be seen in the name of Jesus. Come on, get it right right now. Come on, in the name of Jesus. This could be the moment that saves your ministry in a decade. This could be the moment that saves you next year when you got to make some big decisions in graduation. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Come on, in the name of Jesus. God can do a deep work in your heart right now. Oh, don't look around. Look inward right now. Don't look around. Look inward. Look inward. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Rabatatasatata.
I know this may seem different for a Friday night and perhaps seem that it's more a ministry focused sermon. But again, it's what God quickened me to to identify what to speak. And ultimately we are are all ministers at a level and capacity. And we got to get our value system right. The Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. It's a trap when we have to acquiesce or cave into pressure of people's opinions or how we're seen or perceived by others. And as I was praying, I just had this, this just really just clear thought go through my mind. And Jesus said that his will is that we would bear much fruit. That's God's will for us, is to be fruitful. But I wonder how many people have not been fruitful because they've pursued with the wrong motive and the pressure of finding value. They became a pastor when they never should have been a pastor. They saw an opportunity to get paid or people start thinking they're worth something because now they're a pastor instead of an assistant pastor, instead of a youth pastor. But if you could ever find your purpose, you will find fruit. Because I do believe there's some people that God has called to youth ministry. I do believe there are some people that God has called to be help ministry assistant pastor, that God has called some people to be an evangelist with so many people. And I have no way of knowing how many. But I just wonder how many have not seen the fruit they want to because they pursued with the wrong motive. If you want to be fruitful, would you just stand to your feet? I don't know what that looks like for you. But if you can just say, God, I, I want to be, I want to bear much fruit. Just help me to know my purpose and to pursue that with the right motive and not deviate. But here's where, as long as you got flesh, you are susceptible to going off course. This is where consistency, you got to stay in prayer. You got to stay in the word. You got to stay in fasting because your flesh will try to get you off course. And not everything is so spiritual. Sometimes it's mundane. I remember one time when I started traveling, ministering places, and I just did what everyone else is doing, you know, take selfies and say, oh, I'm just so humbled, honored to preach at big event. I'm so humbled to be at big church. I'm so humbled that God didn't do this to me. I'm doing one of those things, and God's like, what are you doing? I'm like, hold on, God, let me finish my post here. And I'm doing that. God basically just told me, that's pride. You want, you want people to think you're, you're accomplishing something because, ooh, you preach at CLC. So I don't know how many years back you got to go, but you can scroll back, search, find it, screenshot if you want. There was a point that, that's how I got my affirmation. I, I, just want, I wanted to validate, let people know what I'm doing. But a natural way to protect the supernatural in my life is I stop doing that. Because I don't want there to be an open door for the enemy to put his foot in and leverage my pride and draw value from that system. I'm not saying other people that do it, that's their motive. This is how pathetic I am. Other people are probably doing it with pure motives. They're godly, they're holy, and it's awesome. I don't condemn them. But me, God showed me a blind spot. And he gave me my own little Ten Commandments, how I operate social media. 
how I operate other things in my life. Because a lot of this supernatural, we get fixated on that, and we forget all the day-to-day life, the simple things, that if we could start being intentional in every little area and start actually be, and the other thing you're going to find out, if you could get in the presence of God longer, this is with the power of extended fasting, this is the power of extended prayer time, is the longer you can linger in God's presence and not ask him for power, not ask him for toys, not ask him for gifts, but just be in his presence and get closer to him, he'll start revealing the things that we don't like to see in us. Because all of us, at the seabed of our heart, lies dormant, a spirit, an ulterior motive. But when you start depleting and consecrating your flesh and crucifying it, God will disrupt that seabed and it will surface. And you'll see an ugly spirit inside of you. I've lost count of how many times God revealed something hidden inside of me. Because I wasn't asking for power. I wasn't asking for opportunity. I was just pursuing him. Falling in love with him. Relationship with him. And all of a sudden, when you start being in his presence... (laughs) You become very keenly aware of some things that have no business being in his presence. I want to please God. I want to be a vessel of honor. I'm excited to be with you all. We're going to pray, and I don't know who's supposed to close and how they want to close it. But I just felt clear to share that. And I don't know what God has for us tomorrow, but we're going to pray. We're going to see what vein of the Holy Ghost we get in. In Jesus' name, we might run and jump. We might weep and gnash teeth. I have no idea. But we will do whatever the Spirit wants us to do. If you want to lift your hands and lift your voice and just begin to pray, God, I I want to be fruitful. I don't want to pursue the wrong purpose because it's my preference. I don't want to pursue my preference. I want to know What is my purpose that you have for my life, God? And Lord, I pray that I would begin to pursue it with the right heart, with the right motive, with the right purpose. Not to be famous, not to be seen, not to be heard, not to be known, but God, to be pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. Lord, to pursue your kingdom to come, your will to be done. I love you, Jesus. I pray tonight, God, that we take this home with us. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your anointing upon Pastor Micah tomorrow, God. I pray you loose them in the Holy Ghost. I pray there's a flow into the morning service. I pray there's a flow into the evening service. I pray there's a flow into Sunday. I pray, God, this would be the groundwork we lay, Lord, that we can go further because we have the right motive. But if we try to go further with the wrong motive, it will destroy us. But in your love and in your mercy, God, you wanted to reveal motive so we can pursue with the right heart hard with the right intention. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's it. Lift your voice and pray. If you feel like you'd like to stay to pray, you're welcome to pray. Those of you who feel free to leave the conference, feel free to go and gather in the lobby. But if you feel like you just need to take some more time to pray, the sanctuary is going to remain open for you. And I highly encourage you. You just feel like God needs to do an extra work in your heart. You really need to let this word settle in your spirit. Do not leave. Do not leave this place. Let God change you. Amen. Let's pray in Jesus' name, God, in Jesus' name. Have your way in the name of Jesus.